Today, Elizabeth and I are going to be talking about how to choose a healthy house plant and then what plants might be a good option for you. Because no matter where you're at with growing plants, house plants, um, there's always something fun and new out there, but uh, we want you to be successful. That's where the excitement comes from. That's where the um, sense of pride, uh, there's just, uh, there's a house plant out there for pretty much anybody. And um, we don't have enough time to talk about all of them. But one of the things uh, that I'm gonna focus on today is how to select a plant um, that's going to be good for you and what not to look for, I mean, what to look for, what not to bring home. And when you bring a plant home, how can you make sure that um, you don't accidentally introduce something into your plant collection? A lot of times house plants, um, gardeners, I should say, we can be almost divided into two categories, like the plant enthusiast, uh, that would be uh, probably most of us, uh, plant enthusiasts, uh, people that are growing plants uh, competitively, that they even go to local, regional, or national plant shows, um, so that way you can compete, you can buy plants, you can trade plants, um, get an opportunity to talk to um, all sorts of fun people. And then we have kind of the hands off people. And that would be, uh, we buy something, we stick it in the window and we hope for the best. And there's no, no shame in either one of them. You might fall somewhere in between. You might be on both ends of the spectrum. Um, I like to think I am on the both ends of the spectrum on African violets. Um, they're my love and passion. But then I like green plants like the spider plants. So I stick it in the window and if I remember to water, yay. So um, it's just, we can, um, I just want to, touch a little bit about that. Um, when we are looking at house plants, uh, all the plants on the screen are either endangered or critically endangered. Uh, the three plants, the Venus flytrap and the two cacti, they are all native to North America. The Venus flytrap is native, I believe, to a section of North Carolina. Uh, critically endangered because people go out and dig them up. Cactus, cactus and succulents, um, huge. They're an absolutely huge um, popularity, but they're not a fast growing plant. So unfortunately, some people go out and dig those plants up in the wild. We do not support that in any way, shape or form. Of course, I have the African Vala on there, African violets are native to Africa. Uh, they are not a true violet, but what most people don't know is they actually grow on top of rocks uh, in, their in the natural um, habitat. All these plants are endangered uh, from um, collection and from habitat loss. So when you are trading, buying, selling plants, we wanna make sure that um, you're being good plant stewards that you are purchasing plants from cultivated stock. And cultivated stock means that they have been propagated more in a, um, um, I don't want to say humane, but in a more professional manner that these plants have been vegetatively propagated or grown from seed, that they have not gone out into the wild and dug dig them up illegally. So we want to be good stewards of uh, plant people and make sure that we are getting them from um, cultivated stock. And plant poaching is real. It's something that we only think about with rhinoceros and elephants and so on and so forth. This particular plant is called, du I can't say it, du 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 Dudelia. It is a native succulent to California. It is now, um, scarce to be found because succulents are not a fast growing plant, but the demand for succulents has drastically increased. And this particular plant is now um, very hard to find in the wild. So make sure that you are buying from reputable sources and that you are um, asking those questions. Is this cultivated stock? 
And I just wanted to throw this out there. House plants are not the only plants that are being poached. If you go down to Missouri, uh, the wild, um, the echinacea, um, the purple coneflower is being poached because of herbalists. Uh, they are going out, digging up those plants, collecting those seeds. So we just want to be good plant stewards and making sure that they are coming from a reputable source and that uh, we are promoting um, conservation. One of the questions that I get a lot is where do you buy plants or where do you get them? Um, if there is a specific plant that you are um, really, really into, there's a good chance that there is a plant society out there for you. This is a very small snapshot of this, uh, of some of the uh, plant societies. Um, I will share this program with John Porter so that way he can share the slides if anybody would like them. So. Um, you don't have to frantically write down these uh, uh, societies. But one of the nice things about plant societies is that um, they promote um, conservation and good plant stewardship. They also have some of the experts in those areas, in those fields. A very, um, an up and coming plant society is again, I apologize, I can't say it, Arids. This is the group of plants that include the uh, pothos and philodendron. Uh, these two groups of plants are incredibly popular right now in the houseplant trade. And um, so if you're wanting to connect with people, uh, this might be a good way that you can connect with them. You do, they do have memberships and there are benefits of memberships, so on and so forth. So. Uh, if there's a group of plants that you like, there's probably a plant society for you. When we go to our favorite garden center or grocery store, there's a good chance we are gonna be hit with flowers. There's gonna be something that um, we are going to be like, ooh, that looks pretty. Again, African violets are my favorite plants. So, uh, there's going to be a lot of photographs of those in here. But when you're taking a look at these plants, we want to look closer. One of the things that we often do is we find a must have plant and we don't take a good close look at it. And there could be a possible fungus or an insect on it. Uh, the photograph of the right with the um, close up of the flower of the African violet, you're going to see some dust on the flower petals. That is a sign that this particular plant has an insect called a thrip. We're not going to talk a lot about insects or insect management today. That will be in a program down the road. But um, if you happen to see a flower like this, um, thrips like to feed on pollen. So one of the things that we can look for is called pollen shed. So if we have a lot of um, dust on the flower itself might be something you want to put back down because the last thing you want to do is purchase this plant, take it home, and introduce thrips into your collection. And that can be a big nightmare, a big hassle. So take a good hard look and don't be bashful. Look at everything, backside of the leaves, so on and so forth. Here on the left-hand side is a photograph of aglaonemia or Chinese evergreen, a very common house plant does really well um, in uh, lower light to, um, situations. But if you take a closer look, it has an insect called a mealybug. If any of you have ever had to deal with mealybug, you know it's not a fun insect to try to manage. So what you want to do is just take a really good look at all of the in plants, all parts of the plant, the top side, the back side of the leaf, all that. Again, we have African violet on the other photograph. And that particular uh, issue is powdery mildew. So we want to be investigating, taking a good hard look on our plants to help prevent um, 
introducing or bringing home any type of problems. I see that there's a couple questions in the chat, so I'm going to take a quick look. Um, uh, the question from Kim was probably about the pollen shed on the Easter lily. Uh, this is where we need to know a little bit more about um, our plants. Uh, lilies, uh, that pollen is really loose for a better uh, lack of better terms. So it's really easy to uh, bump into that plant and you're going to get some pollen shed. So you just need to look, uh, know your plant just a little bit uh, better. But there is a chance that if you do see Easter lily where you see pollen, um, there could be a possibility of thrips. All right. I was out the other day and um, at some of my favorite discount stores just looking at plants. And um, I came across this uh, palm. If you don't know a lot about plants, you might think that this particular plant has um, a new type of variegation that, ooh, this is a really neat plant, um, something that you might want to take home. Uh, but if you look at the back side of the leaf, you're going to notice um, webbing. And that is a sign of spider mites. Spider mites are a sap sucking insect that could do a lot of damage. And so you just want to take, like I said, a really good look at those plants because the last thing you want to do is purchase this plant, bring it home, and allow those mites to spread. Another thing is that um, um, on here is uh, the succulent in this pink pot. Now you might think the pot is pretty, might think the succulent, the crusted form, a lot of cacti and succulents are very popular. But when you take a good hard look at that aquarium gravel, it's glued down. It might look pretty, but that's not healthy for the plant. And um, um, outdoor gardening, we talk a lot of times about um, mulch being mounted up against the base of the plant. This could cause some issues down the road. Now the plant could still be good. You might have to put some work into it. You might have to get out a chisel and uh, break up that rock. So uh, just be really mindful of those type of plants and excuse me as my cat walks across my desk. All right. There is. All right, question about a coral cactus. Um, yes, um, you can pop, like I said, you can pop out that uh, glued down gravel. You just might need to put a little bit more effort into it. So you just need to weigh, is the risk worth the reward? Now, here's a group of plants that um, we probably have seen. This is what I call the walk away plants. Um, these plants we see a lot of times during the holiday season. On the bottom of the screen, we see um, um, some succulents that have been painted. Uh, we see some cacti that have been painted and poinsettias. If you want a house plant that is neon teal or purple, you might want to buy a artificial plant just saying it might be easier. Uh, we often forget that plants have uh, pores. They have pores on the top and the bottom side of the leaf, depending on some other stuff. And when we start to paint, we cover those pores and we can greatly reduce the life expectancy of those plants. These are plants that we just want to walk away from. They might not be worth the effort. The only exception would be the poinsettia. Some people have wonderful success with those. They can keep them alive. Um, I have not had such luck, but um, knowing that the plant is a short-lived plant, it might be worth the extra how many dollars it is for a premium poinsettia. So that's something to think about. And then, we go to what um, 
so often we go to the back of the garden center where we know that where they keep those deep discount plants where um, sometimes they might be called the hospice shelf that these are the plants that are on their way at, on their way out but they're deeply discounted now what was really interesting is when i visited these garden centers these plants were um, next to big sliding glass doors and as Elizabeth said earlier, uh, we had um, wind chills down to like negative 30. These plants got bit by the cold and now they're trying to be sold. It's going to take many years for these plants to recover. So if you feel that need to rescue a plant, by all means, but just know that um, they might be more headache than what the worth is going to be. So really um, um, not control yourself, but take um, a second thought about this before you purchase these type of plants. Uh, they could not, uh, they could just be a lot more work than what uh, the reward is going to be. One of the things um, is nowadays with social media, um, I always approach plant groups plant um, interest, interest groups on social media that everybody has positive intent, that we are trying to share what worked for us and what something has been um, successful. Unfortunately, um, recommendations on social media might not always be the best because this particular one, somebody recommended Immunox. Immunox is a fungicide. The label does not say you can use it on indoor plants or that you can even use it indoors. And so I did post in one of the African violet groups, I'm like, has the label changed? Again, we are not going to talk about pesticides today, but if you are seeking advice online for a pesticide, make sure that the label list that it can be used indoors and that the plant that you're going to be applying it to is listed on that label because the label is the law and we also want to protect our health for everybody in the home. So we assume positive intent, but we want to make sure that we're applying any type of pesticide properly. So you just bought that plant, that must have plant. And um, one of the philosophies or practices out there is called dirt. And I'm gonna walk through these um, letters here in um, just a second. And the first thing is disbudding. In some of the flowering plants, such as the African violet, we know that thrips and other insects do like to hang out in the flower. This budding the plant can remove that potential insect from coming inside into your collection. Now, here's the ironic part. You just, I just spent $20 on a four inch African violet because I thought the flowers were pretty. Then I just ripped off all the flowers. People think I'm crazy, but I will show you why we do that here in just a couple minutes. Now, this is not going to be for every plant that you have purchased. This is going to be uh, orchids. They might flower once a year. You just drop $50 on the plant. You're not going to be taking those flowers off. So use this with caution, but um, depending on the plant, removing the flower can actually prevent bringing an insect home or a disease home to your collection. I'm going to talk about isolation the most. Uh, isolation is probably one of the best ways to help prevent the spread of, um, of, of diseases and insects. So um, social distancing has been in the news for the past year, and this also applies to our houseplants, that we want to, um, when we bring something home, that we want to isolate. One of the things that you can do if you already have a collection and you do watering 
bottom watering through a tray is get some of those uh, fluorescent light diffusers. And you can cut these out to fit on top of the tray. And this is a really nice way to, for a couple things. We are keeping our plants a little bit more distance that if there's an insect in any of these three plants, one of them that we deal with a lot is called soil mealybugs. Uh, they like to climb out of the bottom of the pot and move to the next plant right next to it. By creating a little bit of a barrier, they can't really climb around these light diffusers very well. It's a great way that you can help isolate your plants uh, to keep them from um, moving one insect to the next door. And um, on a side note, this is a great way that you can increase the humidity around your plants. You can put water at the bottom of the tree. The plants are lifted up out of the water, and as that water evaporates, we create a nice microclimate around those plants. Because when we have plants in all these plants at the same tray, we water insects like soil mealybug can float out and move to neighboring plants because all your pots should have holes at the bottom. So um, just keep that in mind that we do want to try to physically isolate our new plants when we bring them indoors. You can put them in Ziploc baggies in clear plastic bags um, if you just have one of them. It's just a really easy way to prevent an insect or a disease from moving from one plant to the next. And um, people ask, how long should you isolate them? Ideally, a couple months. It's one thing to isolate, but if you're not paying attention to the plant, um, it's not going to do any good. You're going to want to look for insects. You're going to want to look for possible diseases. All right, and again, isolation can be in lots of different ways. Um, Tupperware containers, I, there's the sky is the limit, but um, keeping your plants isolated that you just purchased will help prevent headaches down the road. And if you have the space, you can always do like an isolation shelf uh, clear plastic domes, um, they come in various heights now, so you can put smaller plants into it. Now, this isn't going to work for a, um, a monsteria that's in a 10-gallon pot. So uh, when we're dealing with our larger plants, we want to have, we really want to take a good look at them. And before we put them next to our, our neighboring plants. And um, if we do put those plants in proximity, we want to try to prevent the plants from touching because spider mites can crawl from one plant to the next. So just do a little bit of reconfiguration. And I'm kind of embarrassed to show you, this is one of my light, light shelves. It's not the best. Um, but all my plants are in those clear plastic drip trays because I know that soil mealybugs have been an issue for me in the past, that keeping those plants a physical barrier, that interceptor, that I can prevent soil mealybugs crawling out from the bottom of the pot to my next plant. So, um, and plus try not to keep, uh, have your plants touching because some of our insects will just crawl from one plant to the next. All right, uh, repotting. This is the R of the, um, of the dirt philosophy. Uh, I mentioned heavily about soil mealybugs. Uh, uh, they are a issue in house plants. Um, a lot of us have never seen them, but they are there because they are in the soil profile. If you're able to repot your plant, it will give you an opportunity uh, to take a good look at the root system of the plant. And if you need to do any type of intervention, you will be able to. And it'll also make sure that you isolate. Soil mealybug looks like perlite. And I can tell you from my own personal experience, if you stare at perlite long enough, it's gonna move. Uh, 
so don't have your mind play tricks on you. And when I mean repotting, it's not necessarily bumping it up to the next pot size. It's just taking the plant out of the pot, looking at the root ball. And some of those commercial potting mix is nothing more than peat moss. So if you wanted to introduce some perlite or vermiculite to help aerify the soil, you sure could. But we just want to take an opportunity to look at the root system. Again, if you just bought that 10 gallon monsteria, it's not the easiest thing to do, but some of our smaller plants, we can take a good look at um, the root system. And then the last is treat. And when we use this word as treat, uh, washing your plant off when you bring them home in water, is a great way to dislodge anything that could be on the plant. Um, if you picked up a plant at a florist, a lot of times they use leaf shine. Leaf shine will put that nice gloss on the um, surface of the leaf. We want to wash that off because we can have some issues down the road. Um, and it's always a good practice to stick your plants in the sink or the shower. Um, your spouse or partner will look at you funny when you're walking through the house with a fish tall palm to stick it in the shower, but we knock the dust off. We knock any type of insects that we don't see. It's just really good way. Water is just a wonderful pesticide to help reduce um, insect issues. And, um, and yes, with African violets, you can wash the plants off, getting the leaves wet don't damage it. So that's just a myth that won't go away. But it's just a really nice, gentle way to help manage some of those um, potential problems is by just washing the plant off, uh, right? And this is why, um, oh gosh, this is about six years ago, my entire collection of African violets got invaded by thrips. I went to a show, I didn't disbud, and I did not isolate. Three months later, I started to see the signs of thrips, and into the trash they went, into the compost pile in the sky. So an ounce, what is it, prevention equal, a pound, like an ounce of prevention is something, a pound of something. Just doing these, uh, steps, taking a good look at the plants is going to make a big difference and prevent a lot of headaches down the road. And I think, yes, uh, one of the things uh, we will be talking about uh, disease and insect management, potting, repotting down the road. But uh, my colleague Kathleen and I will be talking about fertilizing and watering. So if you have any questions about fertilizing or watering plants, house plants, please drop those into the question answer or the chat box. Um, that will just help us a little bit more to direct our um, conversation next week so we can make sure that we're answering those questions. So if you have a question about fertilizer or watering, drop them in the chat. I'm gonna write those down and so we can make sure we get those covered for next week. I know that this was really kind of short, um, but the take home message is make sure that you're buying cultivated stock and that you're purchasing healthy plants and that you're looking at all parts of the plants and that um, resist that urge to buy a problem. Um, if that's a plant that you really must have, make sure that you have the space and um, necessary means to manage that problem so that we don't introduce it into your home and infect the rest of your collection. So um, at this time, I'm opening it up to any questions, if there were any um, questions that popped up in the Q&A. We do have several uh, questions. Some of them we've answered by text, but I think we can um... We can go back and answer some of them live as well. Um, so one question was about um, 
you know, an idea to answer this, but about uh, air plant to Lanzia, that they're having a trouble getting them to, to live and they wondered if they were getting bad plants. But, uh, and I said, it could be possible if they dry out, but more than likely that's like a home humidity, like right condition type of mm -hmm. thing. Right, air plants, uh, uh, very high humidity. Uh, they are challenging, especially at this time of year. The furnace has been on almost nonstop. So um, a Ziploc bagging um, or a, um, a terrarium might be a good place for them during the, um, I don't know what you would call this, but during the winter season. Yeah. Uh, another question, what's the difference between perlite and vermiculite? Uh, that is a good question. Uh, uh, both of them are a type of rock mineral. Um, there are I mean, more scientific um, um, explanations, but both of them are, uh, uh, vermiculite is a type of mica. Um, it, it increases water retention and porosity in the soil. Perlite um, is very similar that um, it increases the porosity and the um, uh, water retention of the soil, depending on your plant, uh, but also kind of uh, direct how much it needs to be in the potting mix. Uh, we will be talking about soils, I believe, and potting here in a, a week or two. But uh, in a nutshell, that's kind of what, what they do for the potting mix. Okay. I'm going to pop over to some of them that we have open now. I know I see uh, that Elizabeth is furiously uh, typing at one. Um, so in the chat, we have what? What do you mean by cultivated? That is a really good question. A cultivated uh, means that these are plants that have been uh, uh, grown in a greenhouse setting. That these are plants that have been propagated um, um, correctly, following all the laws and regulations depending on where they're at. But uh, these are plants that uh, have not been dug up out of the wild and they have not been dug up and sold to you. These are plants that have been grown by seed or vegetative propagation to, um, to be sold, that these are coming from a cultivated stock and not necessarily a wild dug up out of a, the desert or out of the prairie that these are plants that have been um, ethically uh, grown and sourced for commercial selling. Do you have a better definition, John? Or no, I think that's 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 right. You want you don't want anything that's wild harvested. You also want to make sure that the people aren't uh, like breaking plat patents because um, some plants are patented. Um, so how do you know if it's been cultivated or wild harvested? I mean, sometimes you just have to ask. I mean, sometimes people will outright outright say that they've wild harvested it, but it, you know, it's less likely that a greenhouse will have wild harvested. It's like if someone's selling it, you know, on Facebook or out of the back of a van or something. And that's one of the benefits of plant societies um, that we know that um, these the sellers of like, I use African violets a lot because I'm a huge fan, but with the African violet society um, to be listed as a vendor for that particular society, you have to go through a little bit of background check. You have to go through some, um, there's weeding out. So we know that these plants have been uh, cultivated, that they have been grown from um, either by seed or through uh, vegetative propagation. So we know that they're coming from a reliable source. So I have an answer for this, but I'll let you answer it first. What about using Super Thrive? A lot of people use that. <laughs> oh, Super Thrive. Um, if you ever get a chance to read the label of Super Thrive, it helped when I think World War II, it's got some um, uh, World Fair patents and awards. Um, it is a great feel good item. If you are going to, um, the industry has kind of um, 
conditioned us that we need to add something to the water every time we are watering the plants. Super Thrive is something that's nice to add to the water. Does it really do anything? Not really, but if it makes you feel better, then it's working. That's a, a much nicer answer <laughs> than I was going to say. <laughs> yeah, Scott, I'm glad you uh, answered that first. Um, and I think a lot of it does have to deal with uh, essential nutrients. Uh, basically, Super Thrive talks about vitamins and um, that sort of thing. And, you know, as horticulturists, we know that there are 16 essential elements um, and it doesn't really have any of that in it. But yeah. I do like your psychology and feel good part of your answer. So I appreciate that. Yes. Uh, when I worked in the greenhouse industry, uh, people buy trees, shrubs, perennials. And for some reason, the, like I said, the industry has really conditioned us that we need to add something to the water. Super Thrive was something we sold a ton of because it was just, it helped the the person more than it helped the plants so um yeah it's anyways so that's just a nice way of saying that it doesn't really have anything in it and you if you look at the label it will say it's a proprietary formula so we, you don't even know what's in it but the actual like nutrient level is like there's there's no nutrients in it and none of the vitamins that they list are things that we know that plants actually take up to use. They create those things themselves. So that's a nice way of putting it. Um, so for next week, um, this person is just fertilized with some liquid or getting ready to fertilize with liquid fertilize, but it's heard not to fertilize in the winter because of dormancy, but their plants are still putting out new growth. So should they fertilize? When it comes to fertilization, we will talk a little bit more about that um, uh, next week, but uh, the plant should be actively growing when you fertilize it. Um, because of fertilizing a dormant plant can cause more damage than good and, um, and less is more. Um, so if it's calling for a tablespoon cut it down to maybe a half or a quarter of a tablespoon. Uh, but if the plant is actively growing, then fertilization, um, if needed, you can do. Yeah, I would say if it's still actively growing, um, then, you know, it needs, you know, and you know that it, it needs fertilizer, you know, and, you know, you don't want to just fertilize just to, for the heck of it, but you know, these plants are in containers, they have limited soil, so they have limited nutrients. So you're going to have to add something at some point and not do it in excess. So figuring that out is the important thing. We'll talk more about that next week. Um, so there's a bay laurel, uh, when to fertilize and how to water. Had it five to six years, all the leaves are now turning brown. So, you know, that's, that's one that dry, can dry out pretty easily. I know because I have one that dried out very easily and is dead, but it's still sitting there, sort of like, um, you know, it's a, it's a, a dry arrangement now. Um, so I'm not, you know, you just have to sort of, I think, watch on that specific plant. I guess there's not like a, a you know, you water it every week and do this. You just have to to water when you, you know, you do the field test, the finger poke and see that it's sort of dry, but get it before it's totally dried out. I've always heard African violets should be watered from the bottom up. Is that true? No, no. That is just a myth that will not go away. Um, if you saw how I water my African violets, you would probably faint. Um, but no, you do. Uh, water from the top, water from the bottom. However, it's easy for you, but uh, no, they, they could be top or bottom. Okay, I'm gonna speed through some more of these because we've got lots of open questions. Do you water with tap water? Uh, we will talk about watering next week. Um, there's a lot of misconceptions about tap water, uh, but um, tap water, I mean, 
there's just we'll talk more about watering next week and water itself uh, because that could be a whole nother discussion so make sure that you um, uh, tune in next week right so the short answer is yes for most things tap water is fine um, can water in which vegetables have been boiled used for watering house plants that you know that I mean, I guess you could do it. I would just be worried about, you know, that could have particulate in it that would spoil and like smell bad. I mean, I'm sure there might be a few extra nutrients in there. Um, same for the fish tank water. You know, it probably has some extra nutrients in there. I have a an aquaponics setup that uses a fish tank to grow plants. Um, but you just want to make sure that, you know, you're not getting too much particulate in there that can smell bad. Uh, I'm going to recommendations for keeping a rosemary plant alive through the winter months. Um, good luck. I, I I hate saying that rosemary is just a very challenging indoor plant. Give it as much much bright light as you could possibly give it, and um, it likes to dry out between waterings, but don't let it dry out too much. It. It takes practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have two orchids that are going crazy with blooms. Should I fertilize to help the blooms? Uh, uh, that answer would be no, um, because the plant has already been, it is in flower. Yeah. I think it actually shows that it's perfectly happy. It doesn't need a lot of, unless you notice symptoms of like yellowing leaves, I wouldn't fertilize that one. Uh, will you be sending a registration notice for next week's session to today's participants? We'll send a reminder if you haven't, you know, if you registered for that session when you registered for this, you'll get a reminder. If you didn't, you can go back in and re-register for the sessions. You can register for all three of them at once. Uh, will you be talking about splitting or taking leaves from your mother house plants to grow a new plant? We're going to do plant propagation uh, at a future date, so be on the lookout. Um, regarding Christmas amaryllis bulb that is flowered and is done, it never produced any leaves. Should it have done so, or is that still to come? It should have done so, but it might take its time. So hang on to it. If it, you know, still looks like it's, uh, you know, a happy bulb when summer comes, stick it outside when the weather's nice and see if it grows then. Yeah, John, my experience with that is that the bulb is, the bigger the bulb, the mature the bulb, the better the flower the following Christmas. So, you know, you may even want to plant it in a flower garden or a vegetable garden just to help increase the bulb size and make the bulb more robust. And then as long as you can physically get it back in a pot and bring it inside. So it just needs some renovation really and increase in bulb size. Are we talking about amaryllis? Yeah. Uh but, uh, but a lot of times we forget is amaryllis is a full sun, all day sun, tropical plant. So you can literally, like John Fish said, you can plant that outside in a full sun, all day sun location uh, to really help build up the strength in the plant. And one of the key things, um, tricks to increase the size of the bulb is not to let the plant flower. So that way the plant is always putting energy into the bulb itself and not putting that energy into the flower, which is counterproductive. But when you go to the garden center with those giant amaryllis, that's what they have done over the years is preventing that plant from going to flower. So the plant that you put in the shower to clean it, are you just wiping it off in the shower or do you turn the shower on? Oh, good question. Uh, that was um, uh, turning the shower on. It's a messy process. Um, have those towels out and make sure that kids and spouse are not home because they think you're crazy. But uh, turn it on, turn those leaves over, wiggle it around so that way you're getting um, as much of the foliage. Uh, washed off, let that water run through the container because that's good to help knock off minerals and new uh, salts that um, build up on in the potty mix itself. So yes, you're washing it and you're 
making a big mess. So temperature of the shower water? Uh, tepid. Uh, it's Would not, right now, water coming out of those pipes are going to be ice cold. Um, so we want it to be lukewarm. Would that be good? Yeah, sort of warmish. Not, you know, you don't want it cold. You don't want it hot. Sort of somewhere in the middle. Less than what you would take a shower in. You know, so, so someone bought a lemon plant this summer. They got six lemons, brought it inside, cut it back, and now what? Just wait. Keep it happy. <laughs> um, you know, keep it watered um, and just wait. It'll bloom again like next summer and produce fruit next fall. We want to do a few more here. We're getting a lot of here. Um, you talked about Super Thrive. What about liquid dirt, banana peel water, eggshell water? Like if you have that, you can like, if you're cooking hard boiled eggs, some people will use that. You know, it's good to just use the water and not waste it. You know, there might be a touch of calcium in there, but you know, I don't know that, that it's enough to like really, you know, make the plant all that exciting. Uh, and my peace lilies have a great deal of powder that on the leaves, but it brushes off easily. I'm assuming that it's pollen from the blooms, not thrips or mealybugs, correct? Probably very, uh, very likely. Um, it's always good to pay good, I mean, pay attention to the plants, but peace lilies, if you knock the flower, they do pollen shit. They do, I don't know what that term actually is, but um, if you knock it, the pollen falls off. 